So a lot of people looking for hope today. And uh, some of them have been disappointed with some church people. And I think we can all share maybe some of that blame if we're honest. Maybe even in our zeal, we can come off a little self-righteous. Not the goal. You know, Jesus' uh, earthly ministry, he attracted sinners. He, he ate with them. He met with them. Sinners were attracted to him. Not because he gave them a pass, but because he was genuine, because he was real, because he did not judge them with the same standards that human beings judge. Oh, he is absolutely an authorized judge, and certainly we can safely judge in areas where the Bible is clear. You know, don't get caught up in that whole judge not thing taken out of context. We're not judging the people, but certainly. You know, God does say something about sin in His Word. But my goodness, this, this group right here is awesome. We, we're out in public or we're out at the fair or we're uh, during an egg hunt or whatever. You guys are just so warm and welcoming and you share in the love of Jesus. And there are people that need, need to see the real thing. Amen. Amen. Hope is a word that uh, everyone puts at the top of their list, I think. Yes. What do you need most out of life? Hope. Hope for today. Hope for tomorrow. And there are a lot of Scripture verses that speak to hope. I, probably the Old Testament Scripture that has to be top of the list whenever we talk about hope is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The New Testament, it's hard to nail down one particular verse, but, but if I could today, I think it would be Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, last week, we talked about the difference between the, the world's definition of rest and the, a definition of rest according to the kingdom of God. This week... I'd like to draw a distinction between the world's definition of hope and what biblical hope really is. In a biblical sense, hoping is not wishing. There's a big difference. And, and I've been in public ministry for 40 years, and I can tell you how many times I have talked to a believer, maybe someone who has gone to church their whole life, and they say, well, I hope so. And it's almost like we get God confused with Walt Disney, right? And we're going to wish upon a star. Amen. I wish I may, I wish I might. That's not the kind of hope that the Bible talks about. Like candles on a birthday cake. Make a wish. I think a lot of people kind of approach their, their relationship with God with wishful thinking and not with hopeful thinking. Listen to this. Listen. You wish for what you have no reasonable expectation of receiving. You hope for what you've been promised. Amen. Your wishes are out there. I wish I could win the lottery. I wish I could. I wish I might. I wish I may. And there's just no reasonable expectation that that's going to happen. But when you hope in God. When you hope in His promises, you have placed your everything in something that is absolutely true. And that's why in Hebrews 11, 1, we say that faith is the, the evidence, right? The evidence of things not seen. That, that's the, we can't see it with our eyes, but we know it just the same. This is the kind of hope that we're to have. Christians should not go around wishing for things. Christians also shouldn't go around acting like God owes them something. Amen. It's always extremes, isn't there? Isn't there? Aren't there extremes? Can, can I go on record as saying that we generally go to that extreme first? 
well, I'm not going to tell God what to do. That's generally what I see as a lot of good, God-fearing German people (laughs) saying here in South Central Pennsylvania, oh, I could never. Whereas God gives us so many promises in His Word that He expects us to trust Him. When you deny God what He wants to give you or have for you, you're slapping Jesus in the face. So just so that we have that accountability, let me go on record also by saying we don't get to tell God what to do. And and my heart says that God doesn't owe me anything. He's done everything for me. But let's not have that come out of one side of our mouth and out of the other side of our mouth say, well, I hope so. Because that's not honoring God either. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Taken from a purely fleshly viewpoint, you could take that and say, That means that if I honor God, He's going to give me all my want-tos. Now, what it says is, if you delight yourself in the Lord, your heart changes. If you're you're trusting Jesus, your heart's desires change. But listen, let's, let's also cover the other side of that that we forget to do so many times. That as you do delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. We're not following God only when we're doing something we don't really want to do. Where do we come up with this? Where do we get this idea that following Jesus is miserable? I've met so many people that could wear that T-shirt, you know. (laughs) So happy in Jesus. And if you really love Jesus, you'd be as miserable as I am. Followers of Jesus have every reason to know what they can put their hope in. And we should live with expectation. We should not have to live with wishful thinking. Have you heard? Have you? What was that? Attitude of gratitude. Attitude of gratitude. How many times have you been involved in a group of people praying together? And, and you'll hear this incredible prayer. God, we come against these forces of evil that are, and there's all this declaring and stuff going on. And then at the end of the prayer, they go, nevertheless, <laughs> not my will, but thine be done. As if God needs an out. If he's having a bad day, we want to give him an out. Let's get balanced. Let's understand who we are in Christ what He has promised us, and be willing to let our hearts change to be after the things that God is after in us. The words of Jeremiah 29, 11, we hear them all the time. Uh, you see this on Facebook, social media, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 gets quoted and requoted, and it's okay, it's okay, but I think it would be best to understand where that comes from and what was going on. See, these words are part of a letter that Jeremiah wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and had sent to the leaders of the nation of Judah, which had been ripped from their homeland and taken captive to Babylon. Now, anybody here ever been ripped from your homeland and taken captive to Babylon? Probably not. But this is the situation that was going on when God spoke these words to Jeremiah to the leaders, not just the average Joe and Josephine, but the leaders who had been removed from their homeland because it was all part of God's uh, discipline for their disobedience. But God wanted them to know something. He wanted them to know that, listen, I don't have plans to to leave you here. I have plans to prosper you. I have plans not to harm you. I have plans to give you a hope 
and a future. So go ahead and quote that verse, but not when you don't get your way, or not when you're stuck in a life of sin and you're paying the consequences of that life of sin, and you say, well, you know, the Lord said He has plans to prosper you. Yes, He does, but He's not going to prosper you if you keep living your life against Him, right? Right. So this verse gets tagged on to everything, and sometimes it just doesn't fit. Let's use it in its proper sense, because there is a New Testament application for this, and that is this. God is not withholding good things from you. God is not sitting in heaven with a smite button looking for every opportunity for you to mess up. He does have plans for you to prosper you, to give you a future, and to give you hope. And that's not just someday by and by when I die. That's here and now too. God is not the author of turmoil and pain. We make enough of that on our own. And His grace and His mercy, while He may discipline us, His grace and His mercy says, I want you to grow out of this period of disobedience, and I want to help you experience the full life that I've intended for you to live. 3 John 1, verse 2. John uh, John the Apostle is writing to his friend Gaius, who's a fellow believer in Jesus, who's gone through some tough times. And at the very beginning of this letter, he writes, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. If John the Apostle, one of the closest disciples of the Lord Jesus, could open a letter to a fellow believer praying that they would prosper in all things and be in health, how can we ever say that it's not God's will for us to be successful and to live in health? Now, I'm not name it and claim it and blab it and grab it kind of a guy, but let's not go to the other end of the spectrum here. Let me read that same verse in the New Living Translation. Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. God's concerned about our entire being, body, soul, spirit. The words of Hebrew 11.1 link the stories of those who lived by faith under the Old Covenant to the Jewish Christians that were living in the first century who had come to faith in Jesus Christ and, and, and written to Hebrews. So, who was it written to? Hebrews, right. That, excellent. Good answer. So, and we read this, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's not saying that faith makes your wishes come true. It's not saying that if you can imagine it, you can have it. But it is saying that faith in God is itself the proof, the evidence of the expectation that God gives His children about what is not yet but will be. And, and I think maybe, what, would you say the 80s and 90s, everything was about faith? The church has gone through fads, if you didn't know that. Go on YouTube and look up some old preacher from way back or some Christian television program and, and notice how strange it looks looking through the eyes of the 21st century. And and there were a lot of fads with faith, and there was the Word of Faith movement, which in itself is biblical, but it had its extremes, right? So, sometimes I guess we we kind of steer away from something, but I think we live in an age now that faith needs to come more to the forefront, because everything that we do in Christ is by faith. I have never seen God. I have never seen Jesus. I, I trust Him by His Word and the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me that gives evidence to the Word of God that is our primary means of hearing from God. But it's all by faith. We don't get to see it. Faith itself is its own evidence. Whether you're coming to Christ for salvation, for healing, for spirit baptism, for all of these different things that 
we experience it in the life of living for Jesus. It's all by faith. Second Corinthians, a lot of scripture this morning. I haven't asked you to turn anywhere yet. I will in a minute. Second Corinthians 1, 19 and 20 says, For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you. This is Paul speaking. And as God's ultimate guest, he always does what he says. Amen. He's faithful. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. That's the New Living Translation's version of a, of a, a verse that you may be familiar with in another Translation. See, there's a direct connection between faith, hope, confidence, and joy. A direct connection. And when you try to experience hope apart from all of those things, it doesn't last. It's fleeting. It's temporary. It's like all of the commercials on television, right? Every pill to do everything. And then they have the warnings on there, right? <laughs> may cause horrible death, uh, <laughs> bleeding through your eyes, and all of these things. Temporary. Doesn't fix the problem. Now, I am going to ask you to open your Bibles, if you have them with you, Romans chapter 5. This is where we're going to land for just a little while. Be on your screen as well, but it's always good to match it with a page in your Bible or even your Bible on one of these things. That's fine, too or one of these, however that works for you. It's the Word of God. Doesn't make you more holy if you read it out of, off the paper, right? We were at men's, uh, men's uh, prayer last Tuesday, and Rob Hudson was sitting next to me, and he had this Bible with just a little tiny print. I said, God bless you, brother. How do you read that? Now, he didn't think it would make him more holy, but sometimes I think people think that. They have to work harder to read it that's another message for another day. <laughs> Romans 5. I'll look at the first two verses to get started. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully Look forward to sharing God's glory. Boy, there's a lot of meat in here. I, I want to go through it and just parcel this out a little bit because we're talking about hope and we need to understand what it is from God's viewpoint and how it is that we gain this hope that we also desperately need. He starts off by saying, consider what you have by faith. Just stop for a minute and think about all of the things that you have by faith. Let's take it out of the sanctuary for a moment and just think of all of the ways that we live by faith, even if you're not following Jesus. If you have a job, you live by faith that at the end of the pay period, your employer is going to give you a check. When you get in the car and turn the key, you're living by faith that that car is going to start. Sometimes our faith has been disappointed. When you, when you go to the doctor, when you get a prescription, you're, you're kind of saying, by faith, I believe that this is going to make a difference in my health. But when you take that same attitude and, and put it in context of biblical truth, the, the, the faith, that faith, it's not going to disappoint. Faith in God to do what God says he will do. You will never be disappointed. That's another thing that gets me with the prayers, and we, we can all fall into it. Lord, we ask that you are with us. Like, don't abandon us like you did the last time. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Huh? So, consider what we have by faith, and then we get a list. We have peace with God. That means we've been made right with God. That means we've been justified. Justified. Just as if we never sinned. Justified. That means before God, when he looks upon us, 
through the blood of his son. He sees us as perfect. Let your brain just dwell there for a moment. Now our flesh and our emotions and our mind hasn't always caught up with our reborn spirit. But in Christ, we have been made justified. Think about it. That means that God is able to not remember, think about it, Amen. what our past life looked like. Justified, just as if we'd never sinned. We know better. But by faith, this is what we've been given. We've been made right. We have peace with God. Now, there's a difference between peace with God and peace of God. But peace with God, what's that mean? You're no longer at enmity, the Bible says. You're no longer his enemy. You're no longer against God. And you don't want God being against you. So that peace with God says that you have done what you need to do to make it right. You have received this free gift. We have undeserved, privileged position. And it's all by faith. How many can testify to the favor of God in your life? Can you think about times in your life where you're like, there's no other explanation for the goodness of God than his favor, just the favor of God? We can have confident, joyful anticipation of experiencing God's glory. Now, in this case, sharing God's glory is not testifying with somebody else about it. It means that we share with God in His glory. Boom. If that doesn't blow your mind, think about it again. A confident, joyful expect, expectation, anticipation of experiencing the glory of God. And you say, yes, that's right. Someday, by and by, when we make heaven and avoid hell, and those are all good things. But I'm talking about now. We have access to God. We have access to God now and ultimately in heaven. Can I tell you that there are people sitting in pews this morning who that sounds like something so unreachable, but yet when we pray, we come in the name of Jesus. If we think that we do not have access to God, then why bother praying? God has given us access to God, to Himself, through His Son. So those are some of the things we have by faith. Let's look at three to five now. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. How many people rejoice when you run into problems and trials? Aren't they fun? Don't you just get excited? Yay, I've got a problem to overcome today. Says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. This hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because He's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. Consider this that not only are problems and trials unavoidable, and they are. Jesus told us, right, in this world, you will have trouble. Not only are the problems and trials unavoidable, but God actually causes them to produce hope in us. It's one, one, one situation that he uses, because most of the problems and trials we face come at our own hand or at the hand of another human being. He uses them and redeems them that we would have joy. That, that same word in the Greek that's used to express our joy, joyful anticipation of experiencing God's glory in verse 2 is the same word used here. It's the same word. Sink in to your brain. Embrace this. The same joy that we experience when we anticipate the goodness of God and how we can come before His throne is the same joy that God will produce in you when you're going through problems and trials. It's not some different kind of joy. It's not, well, He didn't really mean joy. Yeah, He meant joy. 
And he meant it in the same way. Problems and trials help us develop endurance. What's endurance? Perseverance. Stick to it. Don't give up. Constancy. Constancy. Has anyone ever been under the mistaken opinion that when you pray for God to help you through something, that he somehow is going to make that easier? It's not about making the trial easier. It's about him making us stronger. Now, sure, he may take the edge off, but I don't think that's our expectation. The expectation is that he will see you through. The expectation is that he will develop in you endurance. The Word of God says it's not my opinion. It says that when you run into problems and trials, The problems and trials will help us develop endurance. And and the context here, endurance is a good thing. The Apostle Paul, speaking for the Holy Spirit, is saying, the problems and trials that you're going to face, you can be joyful in that because your endurance is going to be increased. Victorious people have learned how to overcome. They have not had a stress-free life. Problems and trials help us to endure, to develop endurance. Endurance develops strength of character. There's one Greek word that's used uh, that's translated strength of character. It's dokeme, and it means proven character. Endurance creates proven character. It's one word. It's not like we say it's a different kind of character or whatever. No, proven character. That means character that lasts. That means the character that rises to the surface when no one else is looking. It's the character that says, I'm going to seek to do what is right no matter what. Character doesn't exist in a vacuum. Character proves itself when you're faced with temptation. Character proves itself when you're faced with a trial. Character comes to the surface, proven character, when you have had to build endurance to overcome. Character does not show itself apart from trial. Character strengthens our confident hope. Hope of what? Well, of salvation, for one thing. Uh, The New Living Translation adds salvation uh, to the original language, but it's a fair translation of the word because the word used is, it means confident hope of salvation. El peace is the word in the Greek lexicon. So it's fair to say, yes, it's of salvation, both in the trial and in eternity. We're saved through the trial, not, not that the trial saves us, but we are preserved through the trial. You understand the way I'm using the word saved? Uh, it doesn't lead to dishonor and shame. And this hope, this hope, this confident expectation does not disappoint. It's not fleeting. It doesn't run out when the emotions cool down. It's a hope that exists and persists, and I will say pursues you, even when you're facing all kinds of obstacles. It's living hope. It's real hope. How can we know this? Well, the love of God. He himself lives in us. The Holy Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit is every much God as Jesus and the Father are. And God has chosen to invest himself. Think about it. When we're born again, we cannot be born again without the aid of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be transformed into a new person without the empowering Holy Spirit. And we can't live for Jesus without that Holy Spirit living in us. Every human being that is ever born on the planet, God has given a conscience. But 
Uh, unbelievers have a conscience. Believers have more than that. They have God living inside of them to guide them, to direct them, to give them hope no matter what they face. So listen, stop wishing and start hoping. S stop, stop thinking that if stars align just right and everything goes right and people are nice to me and I get a better job and I find the right mate and I get a better car and I have more money in my bank account, then I can be hopeful. Especially when the Word of God tells us that hope is developed in trial. Hope comes from faith. Stop guessing and start knowing. There are some things you can know. And the, the best way to know what God wants for us is to know His Word. There is no substitute. The enemy is one of his best things he can do. He can't keep you from coming into heaven if you've trusted Jesus, but he can defeat you in this life by keeping you away from his word, by lying to you. I could never understand it. My goodness, there's how many translations and flavors and, and chorus, uh, 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 whatever I'm trying to say, <laughs> studies, and right now media, videos, all this kind of stuff to help you understand it. We come together as a church. We don't just come together on Sunday morning. You sit there and listen to me yap. We come together Thursday night face to face. We, we come together some Sunday nights face to face. We have prayer. We have all these opportunities to come together face to face. And iron sharpens iron. We sharpen one another. Get his word in you. If you don't know his word, it's only your fault. There's all kinds of ways to understand what we know that we can count on from God. If we're going to offer hope to the hopeless, we certainly ought to have an understanding of what real hope is for ourselves. Do you want real hope? Hope that goes beyond wishful thinking? Hope that goes beyond making a wish? Or, oh, I hope so. Hope that is grounded and rooted in the Word of God? Let me read a few scriptures to you to encourage you. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Psalm 121, 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. And the only way to believe that is to walk in faith, believing that that's true. Knowing that there's going to be stuff come your way, but you're not going to sit at home on your chair <laughs> and wait until you think maybe you got a good chance of heading out without running into problems. No, faith moves you now. Yeah. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Hallelujah. Yeah. He is faithful. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Romans 8, 25 says, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Long suffering. Faithfulness on our part to trust that God has our best in mind. 1 Peter 1, 3 Blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Have you experienced that new birth that Peter is talking about, that Jesus talked about to Nicodemus when He said, you must be born again? Nicodemus was trying to understand that from a purely physical point of view, and a lot of people try to understand that from a purely physical point of view. No, you can't start over physically. You're at where you're at, and that's, you can't do anything about your past, but you sure can do something about the future. Amen. And when you come to the end of that past, and you can make that decision right now, you can know that the past is forgiven, forgotten forever, and that you are being made into a new person, with desires to live for God. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.17 also speaks about that experience. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 
he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I, and I don't often, let me back up. I don't every week focus so much on that initial born again experience, although there's always a call for those who want to give their life to Jesus. But today, I just feel it so strongly that I think that a lot of times people that come into the building with pews in a steeple, whether they're orange or otherwise, uh, or with all these beautiful petals on the floor, um, sometimes they don't quite understand what hope is and, and what they can expect in this transformed life. And especially if you grew up in church. Especially if you've always come to church. Because that's how I grew up. I mean, my parents met in church. I met my wife in church. My son met his wife in church. I mean, we, we, just, we just, I've always gone to church. But it wasn't until I was 18 years old that I come to understand that the hope is not in going to church. The hope is in Jesus. Amen. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. So I think it's imperative that we understand that the hope doesn't come from a feel-good experience or from your emotional high. And emotions are great. There's nothing wrong with emotions. And we have times here we worship the Lord, and it's just like, wow, like you could just reach out and touch him, right? And we've had some of the incredible meetings lately where his presence was just so tangible and so real. The guys that went to the men's retreat yesterday, Tom was telling me, it was just like the Holy Spirit is just so strong. And, and we love those times, and they empower us. But when we get out of those settings and faced with people who are hostile toward things of God, we have to depend upon more than our emotions to carry us through. And not just carry us through, but make us overcomers. Not just make us overcomers, but share the hope that we have with other people. Yes. We have to be anchored and if we're not anchored in Jesus, if we have not asked him to change us, none of this stuff is going to work. It's, it's nothing more than a self-help class. There's only so much we can produce in and of our own will. We have to be changed. So if you're looking for real hope and you've never trusted Jesus, do it today. If you find yourself in a situation where I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I'm trying to live for Jesus, but man, all of this stuff is just coming down on me at once. Can I encourage you to wait patiently, but hope steadfastly? Your hope has always got to be in the Lord. We've read so much scripture today that gives us an idea of the character and nature of God and what he wants for every single one of us. If you read no other scripture than what we just looked at today, you have a solid foundation of the character of God that loves you and wants the very best for you. I'm going to ask the team if they would come up right as Jim was getting ready to sit down. I got him before he sat down. We're going to sing one more song, and, and, I, and I, I just want this to, to solidify where our hope comes from that we don't have to wish upon a star. We can hope upon a Savior. Amen. Yeah. How many can say, I've been there. <laughs> I've been looking for hope in places that, that aren't meant to contain hope, and I've found a better way. How many? Is that you? Some of you admit it. Some of you maybe haven't reached that point yet. No matter what we're facing, no matter what the enemy throws our way, no matter what other people throw our way, we can have a hope that not only survives, but thrives in the face of trouble and struggle.